So thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Debunking Cloud Myths. I'll shortly be passing you over to today's present, presenter, James Dunkley. Uh, but before I do, I'd just like to take you through some housekeeping points. So first of all, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please write those in the question box and James will take as many as he can at the end. And if we don't get time for all of your questions, James will be sharing his email address on the final slide. So feel free to get in touch with him after the webinar. Uh, if you'd like a copy of today's slides, you can download these in the handout section. And, uh, and lastly, on the final slide, you'll find a link to register for our next webinar in the series, Mapping the Cloud Atlas on the Cloud Adoption Journey. That will be presented by James again and will take place on the 15th of January at 10 a.m. But remember that if you're not available at the live time, register anyway and you can watch it on demand. So without further ado, let me hand you over to your presenter, James Dunkley. Hi, thank you for joining us today. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about some cloud myths and beliefs, about common myths and beliefs about moving to the public cloud. The rough agenda for today um, is shown on screen. We're going to talk, first of all, what is a quick definition of what are the clouds and how big it is these days. Um, and then a little bit around security in the cloud, whether the cloud is more or less secure than the um, set private data centers. Then looking at costs, will we definitely save money by moving to a cloud, which is definitely a commonly held belief. And then agility, and will can the cloud technical agility provide the business agility we're all looking for, before finally having a brief chat around vendor lock-in and the issues that go with moving large production workflows into the cloud. As a very quick introduction to who I am, um, I'm a technical architect here at ScottLogic. I've been part of ScottLogic for about four years, having spent about 14 years previously working in front office technologies in the buy side of the financial markets. And then I'm now part of ScottLogic's technical leadership group and lead the London Cloud Study Group in our office, teaching people about various different cloud technologies. My own personal interests tend to be in the kind of data and serverless spaces of the cloud, and those are areas that I spend quite a lot of time playing with and generally experimenting with. And recently, we've had the opportunity to work on various different projects across Google, Azure, and AWS for some of our clients and had some particularly great successes. So what is the cloud? Um, it can be quite hard to come up for a one-sentence definition to define the public cloud. The, in the US, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is part of the Department of Commerce, came up with a slightly complicated statement shown on screen. Um, trying to dumb it down from that complicated statement, it's roughly the delivery of computing services over the internet for a pool of users, allowing you to easily get whatever resources you need quickly and at whatever scale you demand. All of the major providers fit this definition. They basically have huge resources and data centers available that anyone can stand up and use whatever they need inside it on demand. And then when they're finished with them, turn them off again. And you can stand up vast architectures in seconds and pull them back down again a few minutes later. NIST themselves define five key properties that the cloud providers should have. The first is self-service. They don't expect you to need to involve another human from the um, provider to turn something on. If you want something, you should be able to request it over an API and turn it and get it available in minutes. Um, next, you should be able to access it with a broad range of technologies. All the services are provided at some level over the internet, but you could use VPNs or direct connections from your data center to connect to it securely and from any number of different devices, be it a mobile phone, a laptop, whatever you need. Resource pooling is a great feature that the cloud provides. Effectively, by the cloud being so pride as being so large, they can buy huge amounts of incredible hardware that an individual, an individual person could never conceive of buying. They can work closely with the manufacturers like Intel and AMD to build bespoke hardware specifically for them and produce things that, again, no individual company could even contemplate doing. The reduction in cost and innovation and technologies used behind the scenes was just not possible before. 
As mentioned, you have to be able to stand things up quickly and get rid of them just as easily. That rapid elasticity is one of the main features of the cloud. If you have a successful advertising campaign and suddenly the demand for your services go through the roof, you should be able, it should be straightforward to scale up whatever you need. And once that phase passes, get rid of it again and go back to the normal resources you need. Cloud usage is a message service. They monitor what you use, and in general, they use this to bill you, but that's their, the main thing is it allows you to see and understand exactly what you're using and use this to share, shape your own demands and make sure you're using the right things appropriate for your service. So how big is the cloud? The chart you see on screen is taken from the Gartner figures for 2017 and 2018. The market's enormous. There's many, 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 Billion, millions of pounds spent on the market and it continues to grow enormously. There was a 31% growth from 2017 to 2018. AWS is by far the biggest market leader, um, but it has been losing some of its market share of late, and um, particularly Azure has been growing dramatically. Um, and in the China market, Alibaba has had huge growth as well. As this is the start of the webinar, series, we thought it would be useful to find out where people are on their cloud journey. So Claire, I believe we have a poll? We do, yeah. So what we're asking, let me launch this poll, we're asking what stage is your organisation at on your journey to the cloud? So we'll give you just a few seconds here to make your selection. You can only choose one. So your options are, we haven't started yet, we're in the planning stages, proof of concept, We've got some production systems in the cloud, or everything is in the cloud. So like I say, I can see some answers coming through now. If you just, we'll give you a few seconds just to cast your vote there, just to let us know what stage you're at, and, uh, and then I'll share these results with you. Right, I'm gonna close the poll. I hope you've all had a chance to vote there, and now I'll share the results with you. So there you go, you can see the, the results there to see where everyone's at. Most people with some production systems in the cloud. Um, nobody on the call today um, hasn't started yet. Um, so there you go, I'll, uh, I'll hide those results and uh, back to you, James. So the first area we're going to take a look at is security. Security is generally going the biggest concerns when moving to the cloud. And it should always be the first thing on every designer and developer's mind when they're building a system. You have to build services security integrated correctly from the very beginning. So let's look at a couple of beliefs around security. The first is that the cloud is unsafe. Um, some, some people believe that they can't put the data in the cloud. The second is that the cloud is actually more secure than putting it on premise. That can be true. And then finally, the last one we're gonna talk about today is that it can be difficult to comply with the regulator's demands. I would say, like everything on, in software development, it depends. The cloud has a shared security, shared responsibility model for security. The overarching security principles remain the same. And, so, and whether you're in the cloud or on the, in the data center, However, how you implement those um, principles will be very different, particularly the perimeter is very different in the cloud. The perimeter of your own data center will often be very small and you only have a one connection in it. The cloud is obviously delivered over the internet, so exactly how you defend about that is, can be very different. All the major providers use this kind of shared model for responsibility. Some parts will fundamentally always remain yours. Data security and sovereignty is always yours. They, Cloud provider may help, they'll try and provide some best practice in these areas, but ensuring that you comply with the responsibilities for your data will always remain your responsibility. Some other areas, such as physical security, however, are pretty much entirely the domain of the provider. The vendors themselves have huge security teams. They virtually all use red teams, which are group security experts whose job it is to attack their own cloud and see if there are any vulnerabilities and then use that to improve its defenses. They have amazing physical security controls 
access to the data center is tightly controlled. Generally, no individual has access for, generally, they can only get on for very limited times for specific usage, and they have to request it, and they get a pass granted for a short period, and then it's revoked. They'll be checked for any electrical devices and, all, and such like when they enter the data center. As mentioned on the previous slide, they often provide best practices to try and help you build your workflows correctly for the cloud. They provide example architectures or blueprints and showing you how to deploy different types of workflows. They also have automated reviews, which can try and detect generally made mistakes and warn you and say these are ways you could improve your architecture to ensure your data is kept securely. All the vendors comply with various security standards and these security measures are checked and audited by third parties. In general, the reports are published on the vendor's website and are available for you to download and review yourself. They nearly always come under an NDA. I'm not quite sure why they are so obsessed with putting them behind an NDA if they're freely available, but they're all behind an NDA. Just to give you an idea of some of the regulations they comply to, the list on screen is from AWS for its US market and shows just a list of some of the various security standards they've gone through and ticked the box to ensure they comply with. The last area we were going to talk about under the security heading was alignment with the regulators. The financial service regulators are now all generally on board with working with the big clouds. The providers have worked closely with the vendors with the regulators to ensure they can allow organizations to move to the platform. As mentioned, they provide these sets of blueprints which will work as, can work as a starting point to help deploy your architecture into the cloud. In the UK, the National Cybersecurity Centre, which is part of GCHQ, provides guidance and recommendation for how big companies and the government can use the cloud. They have 14 security principles that they recommend you review whenever considering moving something into the cloud space. So the cloud isn't a silver bullet for cybersecurity. It can definitely be more secure, but it still does need work and care. In general, the security benefits will outweigh the risks, but you have to be aware of the controls you need to protect your data, exactly as you would if you were working in an on-premise data center. The next area we're gonna talk about is costs. There's a belief that the cloud will magically result in cost savings. The two theories we're going to chat up is, is that belief, is, is the cloud always cheaper? And secondly, um, that you will switch upfront expenditure for variable expenditure. So is the cloud always cheaper? Well, if you run servers 24 seven in the cloud, it's likely those savings would be very, very minimal. Um, and if they were significant savings, you'd almost expect that the cloud providers would increase the cost. However, this pure like-for-like -like comparison of a server in a data center and a server in the cloud is overly simplistic. The cloud will, enable, will normally enable access to much more high-end hardware, significantly higher enterprise grade often than you might have access to, and generally being able to get resources that you wouldn't even consider getting for a data center. The elastic nature of the cloud means you also don't have to keep them on 24-7. It, you can just use them when you need them, or make them bigger when you need them, or even make them smaller when you don't. So there's lots of choice there. You're switching to a consumption model, and the modeling, modeling cost is a lot more complicated. It's like having a water meter fitted in your house. It allows for more transparency, and it could be cheaper, but it can also be more expensive. You need to understand your usage to make savings. And to make a large saving, you may need to spend a significant amount of time re-architecting the platform, the software you're moving into in the cloud. Second area is switching upfront expenditure for variable expenditure. It's true the consumption model does generally remove the initial capex needed for purchasing hardware to set up a data center, for example, but if you manage the cloud estate badly and you end up you can end up spending a lot of underutilized resources that you've turned on it can cost you a lot of money the other area is that on switching from upfront expenditure is you can if you prepay you can achieve massive savings most of the providers have 
25, 30% discount if you agree to that you're going to use a machine this amount for a period of time. And, and again, as we mentioned on the previous slide, if you do a lot, you can achieve massive savings by re-architecting the software you're moving. But that will have a massive upfront cost if you're in remodeling and redesigning your software to work in the cloud. So the cloud isn't always cheaper, but it can be. And like-for-like -like comparisons are definitely not straightforward. Well, it's very hard to get exactly the same as you have in a data center. And while upfront expenditure on the cloud, upfront expenditure is not required, spend it, preserving stuff upfront will save you money. But you can do this at any point. It doesn't need to be at the very beginning. Moving on to look at cloud agility. The cloud has unparalleled technical agility. You can create any computing resource you need whenever you want. But the thing we're really after is getting business agility. And that technical agility can be an underpinning to this. So let's have a look at a couple of beliefs around this area. The first is that the cloud will automatically give you business agility. And secondly, that we're going to have to automate everything to use the cloud. As mentioned, the cloud does have generally unparalleled technical agility, and this can underpin the growth in business agility. It will allow for faster time to market and faster innovation if your business is in a place to do it. It's so flexible. You can easily get any computer you like of any scale you like in seconds. Test something out, and if it works, it can be in production in minutes. And if it doesn't work, you can get rid of the whatever computer, however powerful, a few seconds later. But the first question is, can the rest of the business keep up? Imagine if you have a supply chain and you're trying to deliver physical things. Just because the software side can scale up doesn't mean that that side can. In, even in the software world, there can be various bottlenecks inside the organization that just could not cope with the new agility the cloud provides. Can you get approvals? Can you get everything verified and checked before it goes to market quickly enough? You can only get the true business agility if the entire organization is able, able to keep up with the pace of change. There's another belief that you have to automate everything to enable this agility. And while automation is often a key pillar to success in the cloud, it isn't required. And it certainly doesn't need to be a binary switch. I'd indeed argue it shouldn't be a binary switch. Automation should be a journey. You should be ultimate starting to learn and work out what works for you and your software. You could start with simple deployments and then build it up to much fuller, more advanced, continuous releases of advanced software, much like the Netflixes and the Spotify's do. But you don't have to go from zero to the end instantly. There is another, there is another fear within IT departments that that automation can also lead to the loss of jobs and it poses a threat to them. Like many things, it doesn't mean to lead to the end of loss of jobs, just we, they will help reshape their job. It's possible they no longer have to do all the mundane stuff if a lot of the automation is taken away. Instead, they can concentrate on generating real added value to the business and actually being more indispensable to the business. So like in security, the cloud is not an instant cure for business agility. It's a tool which will allow you to move forward, but it doesn't get you there all by itself. To get the most value out of the cloud, there will be a big investment in business processes and internal procedures and potentially some investment in automation as well. So the last area we're going to look at is the fear around vendor lock-in. It's that fear that one single provider will become so key to your business. And interestingly, this is often the case anyway. Many businesses use a single data center provider to provide their, where they store their hardware anyway. So let's take a look at a couple of beliefs around this area. First, that you've got to go all in on a single provider. Second, it can be very hard to move between providers. And finally, how do we achieve the required availability? The SLAs the cloud providers give aren't worth anything. They, they, the most you're going to get back is the monthly subscription, which probably isn't anything like what you need. So let's start with going in on a, with a single provider. There is a perception you have to move everything, but you really don't have to. Hybrid solutions are provided by all of the vendors now and can be a great initial stepping stone to move some systems into the cloud, connected back to the data center as you need. You certainly should start with 
some easier workloads before moving on to the really more advanced complicated ones and prove that you can get good good wins there before trying to the ones that will take a lot longer to get a big win. Again, it doesn't need to be with a single provider. You can, you can mix and match for the best of both worlds. Single providers are easier and generally can make it quicker to get on to get started, but you can certainly leverage different ed providers to provide different resources to get you the best of both worlds. There's no question it can be hard to move between providers. However, they're increasingly offering similar, similar platforms and technologies between themselves. Third party and open source technologies like Terraform or Kubernetes make it easier and easier to move between each of the different providers. But you must be careful to avoid that you're not building to the lowest common denominator. All the providers have specialties. All of them are certain areas they are more skilled in or less skilled in. And it's where if you build to the common level, you'll lose out on a lot of the value that your chosen provider or providers can give you. You should, however, know and understand the areas that will be unique to a single provider and would be very hard to move. The last area we're going to look at is availability. Most of the providers have something like four nines availability. This means up to five minutes a month where it's not available or nearly an hour a year. This can be a reason to use mul multiple providers, but you should be realistic about the added complexity that will give you. If you look at the issues on AWS's EC2s within London, they haven't had any outage on actual EC2 instances since 2017, and even then it was only on a single availability zone. So if you built the best practices they recommend for high availability, you wouldn't have noticed that downtime at all. So, rounding up on vendor lock-in, you should do vendor due diligence, just as you would if you were choosing your own um, data center provider. You should know which parts of your estate would be hard to move and where you will be locked in, just so you understand and can be aware of those problems. And then you should also consider what the mitigations you need for unplanned downtime from the cloud provider are. If you follow the best practices and guidance for high availability, you can normally achieve very close to 100% uptime. And if you absolutely need to, you can consider multi-provider options and splitting workloads across more than one provider. Well, hopefully that's giving you a very quick introduction on some new of the, some of the myths and fears across the cloud. Um, hope we are planning to do another webinar in the new year talking about some cloud adoption strategies. And I guess thank you for listening. And Claire, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, James. Uh, as you just mentioned there, the link is on the screen now for the um, the next webinar, so that you can register. Um, and you can also download the slides, and uh, the link will be in there. So we hope you can join us next time. Let me just have a look at what questions have come through. I know that we've had a couple of questions. Um, so the first question we've got is. What should we focus on to get business agility from the cloud? It, this will depend on your business. I think one of the most successful things is getting buy-in at the top and getting getting a making sure that the management of the high-level management of the business is engaged and committed to going to a cloud strategy. And we can often see paralysis where the business is trying to always trying to find the best possible strategy and not committing to one. If you find a strategy and get decent commitment from some senior management, then that can lead to the changes you need to match the business agility with the technical agility you're hopefully getting. Great stuff. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Let me just take one more question. Um, is there no space for private clouds given the myths you've shown us? Um, I think private clouds are a good stepping stone. They, you still have to, then, you don't then gain all the agility and you certainly don't gain all the technologies that you would get from the full public cloud. Um, but again, it's like hybrid cloud solution. It can be a starting point to help you move forward on your journey and hopefully then step into the full, the full public cloud and the benefits it can give. Great stuff. So that's all we've got time for today. I hope you can join us for the next one on the 15th of January. You can see uh, James's email address there on the screen. So do feel free to get in touch if you've got any questions after the fact. 
Um, and like I say, you can download the slides and, uh, and have a look at those in your own time. So that's all for now. Thank you very much, James, and thank you for listening today, and uh, hopefully we we'll see you next month.